It's been days. I've watched the sun disappear and the blood moon rise. Maybe this game, maybe this is the real world. And all of this, this real world, that's the game. Maybe it was impossible. The full adder. <laughs> maybe I'll never be able to. Oh, wait, just figured it out. Nice. I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to do it, to be honest with you all. I don't always do Zelda stuff. You know, I've got some content coming in the next couple of weeks. So strap in, leave a like, tell me what you think in the comments. And before the end of this video, I don't know, maybe you might, maybe you might feel inclined to, uh, and to subscribe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. One of the things that I wanted to try out this time around is this glitch called Fuse Entanglement. It, it's a little tricky, but basically by timing a menu to open right when fusing an object to a shield or a weapon, the game thinks that the item is fused, but it's also not. I've seen this used to like remote control stuff, and I thought I could use it to like turn the calculator on and off, but it didn't really work out. It, it turns out that the glitch is a bit glitchy. Uh, it wasn't very reliable, so we'll back pocket it for now. But while I was here in Terrytown, I also wanted to grab some materials like the square metal rod and the sail, and then I headed off to the mountain. All right, so since the half adder from the last video took all 20 attachments, I knew it was going to take all 20 of my attached brain cells to figure out the design for the full adder. Having actual materials instead of like the pale green zonite stuff is better since the auto-built zonite objects, they break if it's not attached to at least one thing. So I can't just like lay objects by themselves on the ground if they're made of zonite, they'll at least have to have something attached to them. So I knew it'd be better to have like real materials. Luckily, Mr. Nintendo was nice enough to leave me a little car, so I just drove around the neighborhood threatening to throw a luchador at the neighbors and collected all the materials that we needed. Some people mentioned to try using a hydrant and water to carry electricity, but unfortunately, water only extends electricity a little bit, and it doesn't really work the way I wanted it to, so I just had to scrap that idea. However, there were some other suggestions y'all gave that ended up being crucial later on. You know, I think it's so funny that all that work from the first video can be summed up with this. I mean, it's so simple. So elegant. And now we have this. The first full adder that I figured out how to make. I would go further into the construction of this monstrosity, but honestly, it was a very frustrating experience. And this is only V1. But I think this version is the easiest to understand, like, the, the circuitry. And I think this angle makes the most sense, so I'll explain it from, from here. In the top row here are the two XOR gates. And on the bottom row, we have the two AND gates with the OR in the bottom left. Power is supplied to the first input, to the transistor XOR gate, and to the carry end. Input A and B are here, and input C is over here. The sum comes out the front, and, and the carry out comes out the back. I am not Electro Boom, but I think this is what the circuit, lay, like the layout, basically is. Now, that all sounds like gibberish, even to me, and I, I built the damn thing. So I will do my... <laughs> I will do my best to explain the, um, the mathy parts later when I show the final version. And there will also be resources in the description to help understand this stuff better. I had to watch like a few videos to, to understand any of this. What, what's been cool though about making my learning process public is that it, I guess it's helped other people understand and learn this stuff too. So that's fun. I am a visual person. So seeing these logic gates in a 3D environment makes so much, so much more sense than all of these numbers and charts and madness. Absolute madness. So this is all very nicely laid out and it definitely works, but the problem is it, it, it requires more attachments than I could afford. So a lot of the components had to be laid out on the floor, which means things often shifted and broke and it flickered a whole lot. I mean, I mean, it technically works, technically works, but it, you know, it was hard to get it to work right. I did get the fuse entanglement thing to work, but the power goes off every time I need to go and hit an input, which is, you know, 
less than ideal. Plus there are three sources of power needed for this and you can only control one at a time. So I kind of scrapped that idea too. I didn't have the attachments left over for batteries either. So I had to be close to the power at all times, which made things even more difficult. Again, it technically works, but I don't know. I don't know, it just, it's just not good enough for you, tube. And mind you, I spent like six hours on this thing. I mean, I was ready to be done with it, but it would be a disgrace to my uniform and my mop to deliver such shoddy craftsmanship. I did what I always do. I went to the comment section to siphon ideas off of y'all like, like that rich dude is doing to his child's blood. Mm, ice cream's so good. And I came across this comment from Safer, 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 Safer Projects, where he mentions an object in the overworld that can provide permanent power. Now I thought this might be useful since I wouldn't have to stay close to shock emitters or worry about battery life. So he gave me the name and the assassination coordinates of an electric generator, and I popped on over to the Floria River upstream excavation cave to check it out. And there it is just as the legend predicted. I was super thrilled that this place existed. I mean, this room is a little rocky, but it's mostly even ground. The generator is huge. Plus this room comes with two metal cubes that don't like break like the iron ones on the mountain. And yes, like the room is a little small, but I was actually excited about that since that means I could just stake things directly to the ceiling and the wall instead of having to build scaffolding. So I got to building. And in order to save on parts, I wanted to build an adder that didn't need power to be supplied to the XOR gate, like, separately. Like, looking at V1 from the top again, electricity has to be supplied not only to the inputs, but also to the middle XOR gate here, in order for the transistor to pass the signal through. Ideally, I wanted an XOR gate that is made of all transistors, but somehow sent signal through the transistor itself. So I thought, time to bust out the sail, which people also mentioned in the comments of the last video. This thing is cool because it catches the wind and actually has some like wacky physics. There's definitely some use to this thing because the way it works is the wind will spin it so that one side always faces away. But if two fans are perpendicular, the wind has like an additive property, so the sail will turn to be 45 degrees. Ooh, cool, super loser, cool. The only problem is that the sail will stay in whatever position it was last in when it was turned off. It doesn't like return to a set off position, which is needed for the XOR gate that I had already designed. And then the sail will act completely differently if you have it on its side or upside down, like especially if you have something attached to it. Like what the fuck is even going on here? I spent another six hours trying to make a compact XOR gate with either the sail or, or maybe one that carries power through it like the manual XOR gate does. And I just, I just couldn't get it to work in this space. And there wasn't enough room for all the fans like I had in the first version. I mean, it's essentially the same build as the first one, but I thought it looked way cooler. But by this time, I was already out of all my zonite and, and I didn't get to finish it. And none of this stuff saves, so if I come back, it's gone. And I feel like, damn, like at this point, we're probably going to have to use the cheap, great value full ladder that I already made. But I went back to my blood boy, or, I mean, the comment section, and to my delight, Saffer Projects mentioned another power source. This one was located in the right arm depot in the depths, which is perfect because that is located right next to Tobio's Hollow Chasm, and I needed to do some, uh, grinding. And after I was done with all of that, I flew on over to see what the hubbub was all about, and holy shit! This place is huge! Can you guys imagine the calculator I can make in here if it wasn't for the build limit? I want I want to do like an emulator and mods and that whole thing. And I might do that like on stream sometime, but I don't know. We all know Mr. Nintendo prowls the web and is on site with modded content with them. So, you know, I'm not sure if I want to risk the channel yet, but I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. But anyway, I got to building again. And this room was even more perfect than the last one. The only bummer is that the ceiling is, is, is too high to like stake stuff to. But luckily, there's this route that's a convenient height and distance. Okay, so the basics of the build are 
pretty much the same. But now the wobbly bit can just hang out next to the pillar where there's also plenty of room for the other switches that need power. What I ended up needing to put up there is the second AND gate and the OR gate. The OR gate is literally just this block, because, because if you think about it, the OR gate is literally like two things touching one thing. So this block will be not only our OR gate, but also our carry output. Eh? Resource frugal. The AND gate up there is actually the AND gate that I came up with at the end of the last video. It works pretty well when the fan is pointing up at it, but if the fan is at a 45 degree angle, eh, not so much. I could still get it to function, but it's a bit finicky. And I want it there to be as little flickering as possible in the final version, so yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite happy about that. The think I had was that when input C was on, it would power one fan pointing up and one pointing over to, to blow on the dangly bit. Um, phrasing? But I could tell that this was gonna be too many attachments. So I thought, fuck it, let me hit him with that 45 like Michael and just deal with the flickering. With the wobbly pot part, I realized that if I offset the pot to one side, I could have it standing on the power and the pot, which makes it more reliably powered, but also gives it way more stability and reduces the flickering on this output. And after many, 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 many more hours tinkering, I finally landed on this. And it took a few iterations and discoveries, most notably sticking the fan directly to the input switches, which blow on the XOR gate here, as well as the AND gate up there, which you will notice is now just a small metal spring. That's much better than the swinging, which is where we were getting the flickering. You see, I realized that while the fan only pushes on the spring just a little bit, little movement is all you need to break or complete the circuit. I also moved the first XOR gate to the backside and then turned the input A to 45 degrees, but that's just so it matches with the pillar's shape. Really, it's the same as the Elegante version that I showed at the beginning of this video. This yellow choo-choo is used to complete the circuit for the AND gate back here and sends the power up to the OR gate, or cube. From this angle, you can see that for input B, the fan is directly attached to the frame of the spring. And for input C, it's attached to the, um, the boingy part of the spring. So the fan extends outward when the gate is off. When the center bit is blown to either side, it hits one of two cubes which are connected by a metal pole. The middle wobbly bit is leaning against the pillar, which like before gives it stability and power and completely removes the flickering. Okay, moment of truth. So let's bring up the table of truth. Whoa, 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 don't be scared of the numbers now. Don't be scared of the numbers, they won't hurt you. Let me just explain a little, okay? So we can get over our fear of math. When adding numbers, like in basic math, when you get to nine, there are no more single digit numbers, right? So you have to carry the one and add a zero, right? That's how we get the number 10. So that's because we use a base 10 number system. When you get to 10, carry over, yeah, yeah. Binary is a base two system. So when adding numbers, when you get to two, you have to carry the one and add a new place, add a zero. So that's why two is represented as one zero, as 10, as what we what is normally 10. So if we're adding to three, since one zero is two, there is a zero in the first digit place. So when you add one, that first zero turns to a one, and so one one is three. But in order to get to four, we would need to be able to represent another digit place because adding a one to one one would give you one two, which means you'd have to carry the one to make two zero, which means you'd have to carry again to one zero zero, which is four. This is represented physically with the logic gates, inputs and outputs, well, digitally. So in order to add to four, we would need another input and output. Again, I, I probably made it even more confusing. So please do check out the additional uh, educational resources in the description for much better explanations. And I know this looks like a big old mess. So what I'll do is put some labels on the inputs and outputs to better keep track of everything. All right, all aboard the top. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> when all the inputs are off, the outputs are off. And I think we are off to a great start. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, let's hit input C, which is zero plus zero plus one. So the output should be zero one. 
boom. Okay, now off with input C and on with input B, which should still be zero, one. Okay, now let's turn C back on. So that means it's zero plus one plus one, which is two. So one, zero in binary. Beautiful, baby. Okay, now let's turn both of those off and get input A in the mix alone. So that's zero, so that's one plus zero plus zero, which is zero, one. Okay, perfect, so let's add C2. So now we have one plus zero plus one, which is two, and that should be one, zero. Okay, now turn C off and turn B on, which is still two, so should still be one, zero. Perfect, okay, okay, now, for the grand finale. Let's add input C back in. So now we have all three inputs on and we should get one, one, or three. Let's go! Come on, dude, let's go! It's like, it's like 20 hours of my life. It was like legit 20 hours of my life, that was, it's a crazy amount of time I spent on this. If you're not as excited about it as me, it's probably because you didn't watch the first two videos yet. Go watch those videos. This was a long time coming, okay? <laughs> this is a long time coming. And what a sexy calculator too. I mean, come on, look at that thing. Listen, I've seen a lot of good looking TI-84s in my day, but nothing with a fan and open electricity on it, okay? Trying to make this full adder was not only a real journey, but a fun challenge that I'm happy you've all been here for. I think this video should serve as a petition to Nintendo to up the build limit. Let me loose, let loose the calculators of war, Nintendo. You guys should send this to them and be like, hey, what the hell you think you're doing, Nintendo dumbass? No, I'm just, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Be nice, be nice. Okay, but do send this to people if you enjoyed it, if you enjoyed the ride. And I encourage y'all to see if you can get a uh, four digit adder going because I don't know if it'll be possible, but it, but it might be, okay? Smarter people than me can figure it out. I, I don't know if I'm gonna touch it again. I haven't even played the game. That's the crazy part. I barely played the game, dude. Like I haven't even beaten it. A comment I've been getting all the time is why. What are the practical applications of doing this? And well, if you're asking me, I had less than 100 subscribers before doing this, so that's why. But really, I think it's a lot of fun doing stuff just to see if it can be done. And plus, you know, people are learning more about logic gates. But there's also something wonderfully ironic about a game that, you know, had a whole team of people, developers who, who created like physics systems with, with object interaction and electricity, which, which is all just code, right? Like ones and zeros. And that's all running on a system that's made up of like physical chips with billions of actual transistors plugging away ones and zeros. And all of that, is happening. Billions, maybe trillions of, of physical and digital switches being flipped on and off and on and off, just so I can make this and add to three. Wow, wow, wow. It's amazing. It's like when SpongeBob drew a masterpiece just so he could erase it to a circle. Wonderfully chaotic. Speaking of the spongy boy, look at this little guy. He is the topic of my next video. So if you like media and social commentary or just like looking at my stupid, stupid face, stick around, subscribe, ring the bell, and I will catch you next time.